and so it's important that we that we uh, kind of get a working knowledge of of these things. Uh, also, for the reason that we sometimes need to talk to the people that are are doing it for us to to understand how and why they're posting stuff uh, in the places where they are posting them on our books, why they're reporting it that way. Is that the right way, the legal way to do it? Uh, is it the best way? And later, we really want uh, to be involved with them because I'm not just interested in remembering what the rearview mirror says. I'm interested in knowing how I can change what the rearview mirror says for what is looking out the windshield. How can I report gains? How can I report profit? How can I uh, establish a track that makes us healthier as a company and, and that's uh, admired by our bank a little bit more anyway, which is doable. A lot of banks uh, are hoping, uh, but a lot of banks really make it kind of tough for us. So if you've got your hand out, we're going to go through it. A manager's guide to finance and accounting. And if you don't have one, I have one or two extras. Uh, anybody need one? Okay. Uh, I gave Jake one. Uh, anybody else? You still need one? Uh, hang on. I said I have extras. Maybe I don't. I can pull it up. I do. I do. I do. It is. This is on campus. Ben, do you have one? Okay. We're going to go through it together and talk a little bit about it. Windows requested a reboot. If anybody knows how to talk Windows out of this crap, please let me know. You don't have permission to reboot. I probably, yeah, I probably don't even have permission to reboot. Uh, all right, let's see. So I did that in the middle of a presentation, which also then locked this up. Lock this up. All right. Okay, there we go. Okay, we're not going to go through the entire thing. We're going to go through the financial statement part, uh, which is uh, financial. Th th there's a listing here of, of six financial skills that it says all managers should have. And those six are listed here. Um, and we're going to start with just the financial statement analysis piece, and then we're going to keep working on that and we'll watch a video or two together uh, as we explore that on how we look at financial statements. And remember, we're going to be doing a little bit of a, of a, of a simulation investment um, uh, program, and I've got computers in the room. We're going to start that tonight. We'll start with the heaviest lifting, which is slogging through uh, a document and kind of reading it together and looking at uh, the kinds of things that this wants us to, to learn. And remember, this was published by who? Does anybody remember? Harvard. It's Harvard, the document. It's something <laughs> that's used in their MBA programs. And, and so uh, it's not the only thing that they have. Of course, they have lots of resources and lots of tools that they use in their classes. And some of those classes are six years long. You know, so full time for a living. They're, they're diving really deep. We're just scratching the surface with enough that we need to know in order to be good at what we're doing. Uh, there are uh, compelling reasons, no matter what uh, field we're going in and into and at what level of management we're thinking about, that we have a need to have some of this understanding. And, and so it may be that we're not driving the company's financial statements yet at this point in time in our job, our career path, but as we um, uh, look for more responsibility and more money in our careers, which is something most people do, uh, then the more skills that we have, the, the more valuable we are to the people that we work around and, if, and the more probability we have of succeeding. A, a few more things that, uh, that they are thinking that we ought to know um, is, 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 is involving should we do a venture or not? And that's called an ROI calculation. And an ROI calculation stands for what? Who remembers that? Return on investment. I think all of you remember what that is. So if I'm going to buy a new dump truck, what, what is involved, you know, and, 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 and what are the aggregate costs and what are the aggregate benefits of doing that, and does it make sense financially, and 
over how long a period of time does it take to make sense financial? At what point do I get my money back for that investment? Is the dump truck worn out bef long before it pays for itself? Or does it pay for itself quickly? And then I get to, to, to enjoy the benefit of it for, uh, for a longer period of time. That's an ROI uh, analysis. That's looking at what should we do as a business owner regarding various types of investments that we need to make. Adding people is an investment. Adding capital equipment is an investment. Bringing in a new pile of raw materials is an investment. And should we make that investment or should we not uh, is what ROI calculation is about. So we're headed in that direction. Uh, but to get there, it'll take us a little while and a few classes before we get there. We're going to look at um, the financial statements first. The difference between accounting and <laughs> finance, they spend a little time on. I ask you to read that. Uh, I, I don't think that we're going to spend that much time on it right this second. It's just a couple of pages. And, and on those couple of pages, they talk about you know, finance is a broad term, and accounting is the actual record keeping of it. And finance is going forward with the business predominantly, and um, accounting is keeping track of where you've been. And, and there's, there's a lot more to it than just those two uh, definitions, but that's, that's the, the real uh, fundament, fundamentals of it. So here we're going to look at the financial skills uh, that, all, state, uh, that all, all managers should have. Financial statement analysis. We start with the balance sheet. Not that everybody does. Uh, in classes, you can start with any one of the three financial statements and it will, you would get to the same place in the end, you'd have to explain them differently because one builds on the other. Uh, when Amazon publicly reports their financial statements, Amazon, for reasons known to Jeff Bezos and company, uh, really I think only, I don't know anybody else, they always start with their statement of cash flows. So when you read their annual report, you're looking for the balance statement and the balance statement isn't first. And almost everybody else's it is. Uh, with theirs, you got to dig a little bit through, and you got to you got to read a little further. I have an example of that posted on Canvas already that you could look at later. We will talk about it in class, uh, in a later class. Most start with the balance sheet. So we're going to read things together in this class like we often do, and I'll break in and talk about stuff uh, from time to time. But let's, let's start in the back corner, kind of, we're going to read as we read down this way. Read a couple <coughs> sentences or a paragraph uh, if, if you want. Um, one of the ground rules that I didn't mention in this class is when you're called on uh, by me, uh, you can pass. <laughs> Always you can pass. Uh, there's something about it that, that we, have this, we have this radar and we accidentally call on the person least ready to say something. <laughs> And that's not on purpose. I'm not trying to bust anybody. That's just this, this weird uh, Murphy's Law or something like that. And there's lots of reasons why you might want to read and you don't have to explain it. You might have something in your mouth, your throat might be sore, you just might not feel like it. And you don't have to explain, that's fine. You're welcome to pass uh, at any point in time uh, if you want to or, or, or need to. And that will be just fine. Jake will start with you a little bit about the balance sheet. We're starting right here. Balance sheet is a financial document designed to communicate exactly how much a company or organization is worth and what it's worth value. It achieves this by listing and counting all of the company's assets, liabilities, and owner's equity as of a particular reporting date. So it's designed to communicate exactly how much a company is worth, what they call its book value. It does not do that. It doesn't say it does that, it says it's designed to do that. Let me give you some examples why. There's some things that don't show up on your balance sheet. Many owners of companies say that their most valuable asset is what? Blue sky. A lot of companies say the blue sky, the potential, is a valuable asset. Does blue, blue sky appear on a, on a balance sheet? It's hidden, but it's often there. But uh, uh, the, the true blue sky that they're hoping for uh, it, you know, you, 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 you see that if you're buying collector cars, just give you a, a non-business example. If I like Corvettes, so I look at them all the time, and, 
and somebody's got a picture of one in a barn that the owls have been living in for three years and 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 it's just it's a piece of junk really but but it has potential right the potential is you buy this thing and you restore it and one just like it just sold a bear jackson in vegas for a quarter of a million dollars and you go oh wow this that car's not ever going to be worth a quarter million dollars that car's been driven it's got high miles on it the numbers don't match anymore and and that blue sky that the seller is trying to make me believe it's just not there. And that's the way it is with many businesses. They put blue sky, and we will talk about why it's called blue sky and exactly what blue sky is, and I will tell you how to hide blue sky on your financial statements, uh, and, so, and I'll tell you how to find how other people are trying to hide it. I don't want you to hide uh, the truth, uh, but how we state things is often kind of uh, important, and so we want to state it correctly in such a way. What else does, do people say is a big asset of their company? The people, always, that's real common, and it's real true. Most companies that are really knocking it out of the park are knocking it out of the park because they got a very, very good group of people together that are very well trained, and they've all kind of taken the oath, and they've learned the secret handshake, and, you know, they've, 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 they've learned how the culture of that company works. They're on the right bus. You know, having 100 employees is different than having 100 right employees or having 100 wrong employees. You know, one of those companies is strong. Uh, the just having employees is average. They reboot things back up. Yeah. Thank you. It may keep coming back up as like, I, we'll, we'll just be irritated and it break time all these uh, Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so people are considered an asset. They, asset. they don't show up on a balance sheet. The blue sky of a company shows up elsewhere, but not on the balance sheet. Um, and sometimes it's really well hidden. And uh, patents, what about patents? If a company's got all this intellectual property. Does that show up on a balance sheet as an asset? You'd think it would. Usually it does not. Let me, there, there, there are a few examples of where, there are a few examples of where patents show up on a balance sheet. There are companies that are intellectual property brokerage firms, they buy and sell patents, or they take them on consignment and they exclusively have exclusive rights to a patent and they will try to, to sell your patent to somebody for you at, for a commission and, uh, or for a, a bump, a, a, a markup. And some of those companies are able to put financial statements together that the public markets agree with where patents are, that's their inventory. Uh, that's what they're buying and selling. And, and so patents in those cases are definitely an asset uh, to the company. It's part of their inventory. It shows on their balance sheet. For most of the rest of us, our patents, is, patents are not reflected on our balance sheet. They're not considered uh, an asset until you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that says, Here's why you want to buy our product. We'll protect it. And you know how, how much, you know, the other guys out there like to, you know, this, this gives us the ability. And for some products, that's really true. Um, uh, I worked for DuPont uh, for a while. And DuPont, uh, DuPont has Teflon. DuPont has all of these, kind of Freon, all of these names of chemicals that, that you, you know but don't, know, don't realize they're chemicals. And they own the patents on them them. And, and when they owned a patent on Teflon, if you're going to get a Teflon coated frying pan, it had to come from DuPont. It couldn't be a Teflon light product. Now that's changed now because those patents have expired. They've redone some of them. That's why Freon 22 is net Freon 12 and Freon 28 and Freon 32. And they have all these new Freons, which uh, in some cases are only there to establish a new patent life of 17 more years of uniqueness in the marketplace. Or Seven, or depends on what type of patent it is. Uh, so those aren't going to show up on the balance sheet. I got to do better at this. We got through one sentence or very uh, Josh? Uh, typically, a balance sheet is prepared and distributed on a quarterly or monthly basis, depending on the frequency of reporting as determined by law or company policy. That stands for itself. Keep going, Eric. 
Balance sheets serve two very different purposes depending on the audience you're dealing them. When a balance sheet is reviewed internally, it's designed to give insight into whether a company is succeeding or failing. Based on this information, policies and approaches can be shifted, doubling down on successes, correcting failures, and pivoting toward new opportunities. So in that internal review, that is done in a management meeting, that is done in a shareholders meeting, uh, in, in the college here, that is done in the board of directors meeting. They look at the financials, the current financials. Now, the college reports <laughs> financials differently than private industry does. Remember, we talked about uh, uh, nonprofit organizations and public funded uh, entities like the federal government, the state government, school system. They report uh, financials differently. Those are budget based rather than profit based. That's confusing at the moment, but I'll explain it later when we get ready. Uh, but for right now, the balance sheet is reviewed internally, regardless of what type of team we're on. If we're on working for uh, the Deseret Industries or working for uh, a school or working for a corporation, uh, all of them uh, would invite the board of directors, who are the, uh, the people that are managing and driving the decisions long term for the company, to evaluate and review internal. What the, what the financials are telling us. Because we should be able to uh, keep the train from running off the rails if we're looking at it often enough, right? And so when a company is in trouble, we look at financials more often. Uh, and when a company is doing well, we don't want to lose the discipline of looking at it often enough to detect if there's a trend that, that uh, you know, we can overshoot sometimes. We can do too well for too long and all of a sudden, the market shifted and changed a little bit. You find out nobody's buying CDs anymore. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, that's what we always produce. And, and so uh, th that's why internally you review it. Next paragraph. When a balance sheet is reviewed So there are whole groups of people that have a title on Wall Street. Wall Street's in Manhattan, right? It's the financial community. It's the term we use for the financial community. And Wall Street jobs are worldwide. They're not limited to lower Manhattan or west side of uh, Manhattan. They're everywhere. But one of the most common jobs in, in Wall Street is that of a financial analyst. You've heard that term before. We've seen movies, financial analysts. What does a financial analyst do? Analyze finances. You're all right. They, they, <laughs> oh, here we go again. Don't reboot it. Um, they do this. They do the external analysis. And why they do the external analysis uh, is various reasons, but we in the public market that think we have money that we want to invest, many times don't have the, the hours, the available time, the knowledge, experience, uh, or the team to look into deep under the hood of a company. And so an analyst will take that on. They will give their a, a, a opinion uh, to, could be their brokerage house. Most, most large brokerage firms uh, have analysts that they <coughs> hire for a specific company or for a group of companies. The more dominant a company is in the public markets, like Apple, uh, generally the more dedicated an analyst is just to Apple. And they don't look at Samsung or LG or the competitors that Apple might have in China or, or wherever. They look just at Apple. Others look at the market itself. Maybe somebody's an analyst that specializes in cell phones or specializes in SUVs. And you know somebody convinced Bentley and Ferrari that they needed to make an SUV. And guess what? They've done it. The, that came originally from analysts saying that the market is there uh, and you've got the brand and so you ought to develop one. Whether it's a great one or not, I don't know. Uh, there's, some, there's some people in this town that own Bentley SUVs and, and they're just stupid expensive. That's all I know. I don't know if they're awesome or, or not. But analysts drive those kinds of pieces of information about what the market appetite is from an investment perspective and from a product evolution perspective. So analysts have a louder voice than we realize in the world around us, not just 
in looking at, uh, and they look at more than just the, the balance sheet that we're, we're pausing here for a second saying that is a career. We, we also have uh, analysts that look at types of startup companies. There's penny stock type companies, which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, companies that are just barely getting into the active trading market and, and their <coughs> stock is selling for cheap. We have, we have people that are looking for what's the next home run opportunity in that, in that puddle of companies. They're not related in terms of market types or product lines or anything like that, services that they offer. They're related in the fact that they're all got stock that's selling for under a dollar. You know, and if one of those all of a sudden starts selling for five dollars, well that's more than will ever happen to Amazon this year. You know, they won't they won't increase by a pack factor of five, I'm pretty sure. Now, I mean it, 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 anything can happen. They could fall by a factor of five but I doubt that they'll grow by a factor of five. Uh, and, and, and the one thing about stock is nobody really knows for sure the future, so we review balance sheets to try to get a track on uh, what's going on. Next paragraph. It's important to remember that balance sheets need its information as of a specific date, but the very nature of balance sheet is always based on past data. While investors and stakeholders may use a balance sheet for their future performance, Okay, um, a balance sheet, the most important walk away from that sentence is a balance sheet is a snapshot. It is not just a report of a company on a specific date. It's actually a report of that company at a specific minute, not a specific date. And I'll give you an example of the company uh, here in town uh, uh, was looking at, uh, at, at, at uh, three things at once, the company was under pressure, financial pressure. COVID was happening uh, during this time, and the company had some large payments that were due. Uh, they had some large continuing support that was necessary from their banking community, and they had some internal investment activities that they needed to do, uh, all kind of at the same time, and all of those things were gonna kind of compete against each other. Uh, the bank needed to look at their financial statement, their balance sheet. And one of the things that was on their balance sheet was a, uh, a technology development payment that was due to a company outside of Phoenix uh, in Flagstaff. And that payment was a large payment. It was $1.4 million. And they had cash to do it, but barely. Uh, the, the company was not flush. Uh, and most companies aren't flush, by the way. Most companies have to... You know, you can't, you don't have a spare million laying around in most companies. You may have access to it, but you don't have it in your pocket. And, and this company did not. Uh, but they did have it in the bank this morning kind of thing. So they could do a balance statement this morning that showed a $1.4 million asset in cash in the bank. And it's a true statement they had. It's verified. You can pull a bank statement and show it. But they needed to pay the guys in Flagstaff. So you run a financial statement this morning that shows it an asset this afternoon, you pay the bill. Now what had just happened? The company, the, the, the bank, that, is that deceptive practice of the bank? Depends on how you do it. I mean, honestly, and what you say about it. It's totally legal to do that. Uh, it's just normal operating of a company. And, and so timing big expenses is just good, good management. And if you're trying to deceive the bank, that's illegal. So you have to work with yourself and your advisors to, to understand how you want to, uh, to, to manage things like that as, as they come up. You may be buying a big piece of equipment that as soon as you buy it, it will show as an asset. That may be good. Uh, it also, the debt on it will show as a liability. That may be bad. And, and so learning what the impact is going to be of decisions that you need to make is part of leadership. Part of it's part of managing, and so we will. Uh, we're going to probably take a break sooner than later because I'm going to get rid of this. But in the meantime, we uh, won't complain uh, too much. So the 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 balance sheet can be all we need to understand is the balance sheet can be extremely misleading. And if somebody's trying to commit. You know, they're, they're, they're going for, to be the star of American greed. <laughs> you know, we've got some companies, some guys here in Utah that keep popping up on American greed. 
uh, because they're shysters. And what investors are always looking for is not getting taken by the shysters. And if you're looking at a partnership with somebody, you're going you're gonna to merge your operations, you want to make sure they're not a shyster. You want to make sure that, 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 that what they're reporting financially about what they've done is real. And so you go through lots of effort to try to verify and validate and, and double check yourself. And, and when red flags go off, often that's a good reason to put on the brakes altogether and now really evaluate because much of this stuff is not in clear black and white when somebody is trying to fool us. And with our balance sheet, that's a good place to fool people. You can state things on there that are true but they're not really true in the big picture if you look at the income statement and the cash flow statement together. If you don't know how to read them, you're on your own. They can fool us with the balance sheet. So the balance sheet is that snapshot in time. Don't ever want to forget that about a balance sheet. It's an important instrument that does some other thing. Uh, but it also is a place where we can, we can state stuff in a way that it misleads people. So you want to be careful that that's not something that's going on. <coughs> so this thing just seizes up every time it does that again. Can I ask something? Please. Aren't these big businesses smart enough to ask for more documents behind the balance sheet? It's, it's say the first part of the question. <laughs> Aren't these big companies smart enough to ask for more document behind the balance sheet? Yes, often they are. Yeah. Not always are they. It depends. Um, when you look at small businesses and, and the uh, the, the places where you slip documents, a lot of times you go up a bank. You know, they've got enough record with you, they know you, they trust you, they don't believe you're going to pull a fast one on them. A lot of times they don't catch it for a while, mm -hmm. just because they don't look at it that close, unless they're, they're already shaky on you. Uh, but in acquisitions and stuff, always. In fact, uh, <coughs> they put together a team, it's called doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. And that's what doing, if you're looking at acquiring a company or, or, or uh, merging with a company or even, even setting up a contract with a company, a lot of times that opens up the opportunity for due diligence. And we wind up in due diligence uh, sending that team in there that does look for all these documents behind the document. Absolutely. You know, you don't want to make people mad, but you also don't want to be fooled. No, because uh, Zion would come in every single year on our line of credit and go through all of our payables, receivables, everything. And I would think that the company buying your company with the value being I went through a period of time where Zion, the same bank, came in and, and audited uh, my my stuff every other week. Okay, so that's how shaky they were, <laughs> and and they were they were they were right to have done that. The company had 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 driven down a perilous path, and and so that's giving you a year between audits. That's pretty good. <laughs> we don't we aren't with them anymore because who we're with now it's a lot easier. I've heard that story a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of times, uh, Zions was kind of one of the one that really pushed cabinet tech under the under the bus. In uh, in in not that they were wrong, but those of us that were, we talked about cabinet tech in this class, and uh, uh, cabinet tech went down much at the pushing of Zion. That, that, that's that's another story, and it doesn't matter at this point; it's ancient history. But uh, anyway, so contents of the balance sheet. Let's do this faster, I'll talk less. Where are we at? Wendy? Uh, the information in the balance sheet is most often organized according to the accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity. While this equation is the most common formula for balance sheets, it isn't the only way of organizing the information. Here are other equations that you may encounter. Shall we read them? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Owner's equity equals assets and liabilities. Minus the liabilities. Oh, minus okay. liabilities. And then liabilities equal assets minus owner's equity. So there are really three variables there, and there's a variety of ways of stating those mathematically. And, and it's not, it, it, there, there are more common ways of doing it, but there's not only one way to do it. Now keep going, whoever's next. A balance sheet should always balance. Assets must always equal liabilities plus owner's equity. Owner's equity must always equal assets minus liabilities. Liabilities must always equal assets minus owner's life equity. If a balance sheet doesn't balance, it's likely the document was prepared incorrectly. Errors are usually due to incomplete or missing data, incorrectly entered transactions, erroneous currency exchange rates or inventory levels, 
miscalculations of equity and miscalculated depreciation or amortization. So that seems kind of simple reading up to here. And then when you read the last part that Brock read there, all of a sudden we, we go, well, can it really not balance? Well, one of the things we do in bookkeeping uh, at the end of a period, whether it's a quarterly period or uh, an annual period, we often run a trial balance. We call it that. What is, why do we call it a trial balance? What are we looking for? We're looking to see if it balances, right? We're looking to see if our reporting has been reasonably accurate. Well, and often it is not. Let me give you some examples. We sell concrete by the yard. We buy the ingredients by the ton. Do they always translate right? I bet you say they never translate right. Never. They never ever translate One right. One and a half times the exact. Really? Wow, that's a lot of money to cover. That's uh, one way or the other. That's that, that or the squeak, that's that's wiggle room, maybe. But but the we had the ice cream plant out here. Um, uh, we worked on a green belt project from this class uh, uh, once upon a time, some years back when it was Blue uh, Bunny, and there was a million dollar uh, difference between what their company in Lamar's, Iowa, said they bought in the way of raw cream and what they claimed that they had, what they could account for. So there was a million dollars missing. So they didn't know if somebody was stealing product or stealing cash or somehow playing games in, in the accounting system. They did not know what was going on. We took that on as a class, as a, as a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt project, and, and learned a lot of things. And one of the things we learned was that ice cream is sold by the gallon, and what they call a gallon at the store is not a gallon. If you read the fine print, it's, it's ounces less than that. Uh, and uh, they process it, all the recipes and everything going into uh, moose tracks or whatever kind of ice cream it is you like, all these ingredients are going by weight, and and uh, uh, ice cream is actually processed by weight. And somewhere along the line, they convert uh, weight to gallons of produced ice cream, and they base it on uh, the aggregate weight. You know, a gallon of milk weighs different than a gallon of water, and when you put some nuts in it, it weighs a little different. And so they were using some rule of thumbs on the weight calculations for ingredients, uh, and. They forgot uh, when, when you make ice cream, it doesn't get frozen until the last step. It's all liquid. Same thing in the chocolate factory, by the way. If you're making, you know, if you're making C's uh, candy, it's all liquid and it just, it's pushed around in pipes and pumps uh, that are just hot chocolate and, and candy. And, and then they, they freeze it or cool it, uh, harden it, and, and temper it, and uh, then it becomes the products we buy. And so they have miles of piping systems and vats in an ice cream plant and the one here. Uh, I don't know how many miles, but a, a few. And um, those pipes are this big and they all got ice cream in it. And so how much ice cream's in the pipe? When you do your balance sheet, you know, at this moment of time, how much diesel fuel's in your tanks? All of your tanks added together. You could have you could have a quarter million dollars in fuel easily in, in vehicles just parked around and 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 uh, uh, so that's how they don't always balance because we've got stuff that we've paid for and stuff that we haven't quite yet paid for and we've got problems from the balance point of view. And so all of our businesses are different and so the things that throw our numbers off, maybe we don't have pipes full of ice cream, but we have something else. We have linear board feet that the curve of the saw blades goes away on. What is that? That's the width of the saw blade. Not very much, but when you're making precision stuff, if you needed a 10-foot board, you saw it three times, it's not 10 feet anymore. And it doesn't all add up to 10 feet because you've got a pile of sawdust down there that's part of that board. Who pays for that? How do you account for that? Uh, what, 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 you know, these are questions that are pro manufacturing questions but they hit a balance sheet sometimes as error. And so we have to sort through that to get an accurate reading of the numbers. Let's keep going. Um, here's a more detailed breakdown of the items that fall under the components of a balance sheet. <coughs> Assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. 
An asset is anything owned by a company that holds inherent quantifiable value. A business could, if necessary, convert an asset into cash through a process known as liquidation. Assets are typically tallied as positives in a balance sheet and broken down into two further categories, current assets and non-current assets. Okay. Yeah. Current assets typically include anything a company expects it will convert into cash within a year, such as cash and cash equivalents, prepaid expenses, inventory, marketable securities, accounts receivable. Non-current assets typically include long-term investments that aren't expected to convert into cash in the short term, such as land, patents, trademarks, brands, goodwill, intellectual property, equipment used to produce goods or perform services. So there's going to be a difference in value uh, a lot of times of these things. If I think I've got something that's worth, this is the blue sky product we're talking about, one of the places it pops up. If I think I've got something that's worth a ton and ton and ton of money, the bank just might not think so. They may not think that if they foreclose on my business, that they can go to a, a, a liquidating sale and sell that asset. And, and so the bank will discount the value that I put on an asset. So one thing to understand that uh, is the difference between current and non-current. We'll talk about it with assets. We'll talk about the same thing with liabilities. This is important for us to know. Current is generally agreed to be stuff that's going to happen in the next year, in the year. So it's the, 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 the horizon for a current liability or a current asset is one year. Generally, that's accepted. Uh, so things beyond a year are called long-term. Now, there's a reason that we need to know that because sometimes pushing something from current to long-term is to our benefit in the business. Sometimes converting from long-term to current is to our benefit as a business. And notice they don't use the term long-term. I said that one. You'll see it on financial sometimes, but non-current is kind of their agreement to because we don't know what long term is. The Chinese think long term is a thousand years. And, and you know, uh, I don't. <laughs> My long term is, you know, till tomorrow night. You know, so something in between is the true agreement. Uh, so in accounting perspective, though, there's a lot of things that I have that could, if I'm looking at current assets and the bank is, is, is concerned about my current assets, then I might push things that really it could be long term into current, and that's a way that I'll have it uh, to, to, to bend the financial statement a little bit more favorably to me sometime. Now that, that has a cost with it, which we'll get to when we're doing it. We're going to do this with some examples later, uh, and, and uh, uh, we'll see kind of what those costs are. The, we have marketable securities. That doesn't mean much to most of us uh, at this point in the class. Marketable securities are, are generally investment vehicles that bear interest of some sort, and that's the reason that we hold them. A lot of times we set up things like, if you've, if you've got 100 employees, let's take a guess from those that you've been writing payroll checks for a while. 100 employees, and if your pay period is, uh, let's, let's say your pay period is monthly, uh, how much is your payroll going to be per month for 100 employees, give or take? 180,000. 180, That's because you guys don't pay very much. <laughs> 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 yeah, you could very easily be a lot more if you have a lot Wait, of stuff. For a month? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, yeah. You sure. have more people than that, too. Yeah. Uh, I was and, trying to like, cut it down, but so, like, um, let me think for this one. It's a good no, enough number. Okay, 400,000. You're thinking three something then. So, so I mean, and it, it's just a guess because how much you pay people and how much you call in your, lab, in your payroll costs, you know, you've got to put your FICA and all the other expenses that go with <laughs> normal payroll. It could be. It could very well be. So it's a big number. Um, when you've got that big number, do you want to keep that in cash in your bank even if your business is, is generating good money enough for you to have 100 employees, it's a big number you got to have in money to pay their paychecks, it would be not wise to have it in dollar bills sitting in your office, right? For a lot of reasons, those dollar bills 
our, our, we've got inflation going on and buying less and less at the end of the week. And sometimes inflation, by the way, does factor into our financial statements. I ran a plant in San Paulo, uh, Brazil, uh, during the period that Brazil was going through absolutely incredible inflation. And it was, it's something I had never even experienced that before. And we wound up, we had a, we had a union group, uh, most of the plant was non-union, we had a union group that drove uh, us having contracts. And, and they required us to have a multiplier so people that, all the people that work for us, even the non-union people, all the people that work for us wind up, wound up having a different pay on Monday then on Tuesday, then on Wednesday, then on Thursday. The inflation was so fast and, and so crazy uh, in Brazil that, that we had to adjust the amount of the pay. So doing payroll was a nightmare under that. And, and, and managing the labor costs became completely a different mathematical game than I'd ever experienced before. And, and anybody else on our team, it was a public, I was working for Norton Corporation at the time, y'all know Norton from the abrasives. Uh, field and business and uh, uh, sandpaper and that kind of stuff that competed with 3M. We had a, a large plant there and the the marketable securities that were required for any company with our labor costs, we may buy a buy, uh, in, in investment vehicles that will pay us some interest on that large amount of money we have to pay for, for labor and, and then we'll set up something like a sweep account or something that that takes it out of an of a, of a, 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 a interest-bearing account and puts it into a checking account on the day of payroll so that you sweep money out or sweep money back and forth in. Uh, lots of kinds of sweep accounts. This isn't about uh, sweep accounts, but you're familiar with the term. Most of you have heard that and many of you have used it or are using it. And so that's where this stuff bearing interest, but we sweep it out of it when we have to pay bills. And so we convert it back to regular cash uh, when we need to use it. That's just good cash management, right, if, if we can do that. And, and a, in, a, a, check, a, a savings account at the bank is not a good marketable security. It's not paying very much, 0.7% or something, uh, when it's paid. All right, uh, let me see where we're at. Where we're at is we are, let's finish liability, let's finish the balance sheet and then we'll take a break. Uh, we're at the last paragraph. Joel. Because companies invest in assets to fulfill their mission, we must develop an intuitive understanding of what they are. Without this knowledge, it can be challenging to understand a balance sheet and other financial documents that the company itself. So if I call something an asset, and you're buying my company, and you think it's an asset too because I called it an asset, and you buy my company, you may find out it wasn't an asset. You can't convert it to cash. It was a bill that I said somebody owed us, the receivable. I said somebody owed us, and they told us to go to hell, and, and we're never going to collect it. Or it's, some, it's some, a bill that I report on my receivables, and that company filed bankruptcy. They're, they're definitely not going to pay us. They're, they're not even existence anymore, but I'm still carrying it on my books and calling it an asset. Well, it's not an asset in terms of the real world. You're not going to be able to collect it. Uh, I uh, witnessed a, a bankruptcy uh, that was at the time the largest bankruptcy in the United States. Uh, Bunk, a guy by the name of Bunker Hunt. The Hunt brothers tried to buy all the silver in the market and the IRS caught up with them and charged them all kinds of, of tax uh, things and forced uh, the family into bankruptcy and they, they worked deals out. Uh, one of their holdings was the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, they had, it was a big, it was a big deal. The bankruptcy was an incredibly big deal. And Bunker owned 33,000 racehorses, thoroughbred horses. Uh, that raced in the Louisville, you know, the, the Kentucky Derby and all the races around the world in Saudi Arabia and all the races. He had a, a, had almost a monopoly on the racehorse business in the world. And the bankruptcy said that was an asset um, that, the, that the IRS was his biggest creditor. Uh, he owed the IRS tons of money. And so they seized that as an asset. And uh, uh, then they came to the realize, realization that 33000 uh, thoroughbred racehorses, you just can't put an ad on Craigslist for those. And, and so they had, to, they had to put a plan together to sell those over, I think they took eight years to sell them, so that they wouldn't destroy the market for racehorses. Because if all of them came for sale on the same day, you know, nobody, the, the value would go really down. So the asset 
that they declared that you know some of those horses were ten million dollar race horses. You know, and 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 you show those assets, it's still just a horse. It's worth you know what uh, two bucks a pound or whatever it is. You know, it's it's not it's not that much. So the the way of of reporting our assets has to be believed, and it has to be true enough that the people that are loaning us money are comfortable with that. Uh, uh, all right, let's see. Okay, let's let's go through liabilities real quick. Keep going, Josie. Are we through? A liability is the opposite of an asset. While an asset is something a company owes, uh, owns, a liability is something it owes. Liabilities are financial and legal obligations to put, uh, to pay an amount of money to a debtor, which is why they're typically to, uh, <laughs> Read all of current and non-current, Eli, and then we'll have Brad read owner's equity. Current liabilities typically, typically refer to any liability due to the debtor within one year, which may include payroll expenses, rent payments, utility payments, debt financing, accounts payable, other accrued expenses. Non-current liabilities typically refer to any long-term obligations or debts that will not be due within one year, which might include leases, loans, bonds payable, provisions for pensions, or deferred tax liabilities. Liabilities may also include an obligation to provide goods or services in the future. Check. Owner's equity. This is the one that is kind of a new term for most of us, probably. Owner's equity, also known as shareholder's equity, typically refers to anything that belongs to the owners of a business after liabilities are accounted for. If you were to add up all of the resources a business owns, the assets, and subtract all of the claims from third parties, the liabilities that are legally left over is the owner's equity. Owner's equity typically includes two elements. The first is money, which is contributed to the business in the form of an investment in exchange for some degree of ownership, typically represented by shares. The second is earnings that the company generates over time and returns. This is what the real value of the company is. It's after you've paid off all the debt, what do you have left? And and, and that's, that's really uh, what we want to focus on. So here's a balance sheet. We see the assets and liabilities, and I think this is right where we want to we want to stop after we we look at the green sheet too. Let's look at the at the the four insight things that we see. Number one is up at the top. Number two is here. Number three is here, and number four is here. So let's look at number one. Brandon, read, read us about number one. <coughs> Um, the reporting period ends on June 30th, 2020, and, the, and compares against a similar similar reporting period from the prior year. Okay, when we look at a balance sheet at first glance, it's, it's uh, not a rule of which column is on the right. In this case, the column that's on the right is last year's column. The column that's current in the 2020 statement is the interior column. Typically, companies that are, I don't know, often they'll put whichever column is the bigger on the outside, because you'll think that's the current one, even if it's not. If the sales are dropping, often I'll see these two columns flip because we're seeing the better performance on the outside column. And you gotta, so what that says is, you gotta go look at the dates. And they're there, they're in black and white, and shame on us if we miss that. Surprisingly enough, a bunch of people miss that when they look at, at, at the financial statement. Number two, back to you, Jake. The company's assets total $60,172, including $37,232, and current assets $22,241. Okay, where do you see the $37,232? You don't. You have to do the math. It's this number minus that number, right? And if you don't do that, uh, in this case, it doesn't matter. It's a pretty decent asset. Uh, often, if if the if if 
if what is current is dismal looking, they'll for sure hide that number. It'll be there, but you'll have to do the math to see it. And and that's kind of a deceptive idea, but um, it's up to us to learn to read the financial statement and see what it really is saying. In this case, the the 37,000, the pretty good number they are listed, they could, wouldn't have had any problem uh, putting another subtotal in the middle there or put it in off to the side so that you can see what that number is. But in this case, you've got to do the math. Number three, John. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, the company's liability total 14,000 of it, there is no number that says 14,000. You have to do the math to see the company's current liabilities. That's owing quite a bit, and so it would be good of them to kind of hide that a little bit, not not make it blink, not put it in a blinking light that goes, hey, we owe a bunch of money. Uh, and, uh, and and by the way, I'm, I'm talking about, I, we're reading those numbers as if they're, that's really $14,000. That's not what that is, right? When we're reading the financial statement, those numbers are always expressed in some other term than actual dollars and cents. In this case, it says at the very top, one dollar equals one thousand dollars. So what that says is the company's liabilities total Fourteen million. Yeah, fourteen million. Okay, that's a bigger number, <laughs> right? And and so uh, I, I mean that that's that's we want to bear in mind that all of those numbers are going to be in something, and current uh, larger corporations those numbers are in millions. So we're looking at a billion dollars in in what the, in in one little line item on those. So always go back to see what terms they are. In this case, they're in thousands, which means for every one of these, you add three zeros to it. And adding three zeros to it kind of changes the, the impact or the importance sometimes of a number. Number four, Eric, what you? A company retained $45,528 in earnings during the reporting period, slightly more than the same period a year prior. Okay, now it brings up something that we're doing. We're, we're always comparing this versus this uh, to see what the trend is. And and often, I'll just even make notes. You know, I'll put, a, I'll have a column. I put plus or check marks or highlight everything that's up. Uh, or maybe I highlight everything that's down, depending on, on what we're doing when we're looking at the company. But, but I want to know, there's an explanation for everything that's down. And sometimes it was like, well, remember, we shut all the businesses down because of COVID. I do remember. Yeah, that explains a lot. It doesn't explain everything. We had companies that went out of business because they were badly managed and they blamed it on COVID. Right? We, did, we really did. Uh, we had other businesses that were well managed and went out of business and it was the fault of COVID. All right. So we are going to uh, pause, take a break in a second. When we come back from break, we are going to look at our investment challenge. And I think we should be able to do this in time. Callie, you've got a meeting you've got to go to, so I'd like to get started on this before you have to go, if, if, if you can. Um, in in uh, this cabinet are laptops. So when you come back from break, uh, take a laptop, if you would. The, the password on those laptops is DXATC11. Right there, and if it needs a login, your login is student on those uh, those uh, laptops. When you get those, um, uh, I'd like you to go to Investopedia and uh, do a Investopedia.com a front slash simulator, and and we'll do that together in class. But if you want to head start when you come back from break, uh, you can do that. Uh, so we're going to talk about the game we're going to set up uh, in. Uh, in, in running, tracking some investments here in this class that will later require us to read some financial statements and 
make uh, some decisions that way as investors. That's not what the class is about, but that's what we're going to do uh, for a little bit of fun uh, during during the course of the uh, of the program. So take a break, break now. We'll see you in ten minutes. Uh, grab a laptop when you come back. Uh, pay attention to how it's hooked up. The charger is plugged into it. When I return them to the medical people later tonight, the chargers need to be put back into them or I get in trouble. So please kind of pay attention to that. When you put it away, put it away in the same way. And when you got your own laptop, you're going to have to get a laptop. <laughs> you're welcome to get a laptop if you want to. But is that going to be okay for you to yeah. get started in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I mean, leave when you need to leave, but I want you to know about this. Thing, so.
And guess and check were getting to the point where I was just guessing and not thinking through my guess. Even it was like I'm just so frustrated that I was just getting something. And just kind of like,
I think everybody's back from break. Um, I want you to, if you haven't already, I want you to go to investopedia.com and then front slash simulator. And you can see I've got that landing site pulled up here. It gives us an opportunity. Later on, you may want to have a real portfolio uh, with a firm. This could be one of the places. Um, and uh, because this is a simulator, this one, you can't put cash in there. Uh, if you do the beginner game, which you're welcome to do, I'll watch, I'll show you that in a second. It starts you with $10,000 of fake money, it's monopoly money. Uh, it's not worth cash at any point ever, but it trades and it behaves just like if you have an actual account with this, with this company uh, or, uh, it would behave like it's behaving on the market. And um, if you open a, the normal, the, the regular game account, they start you with $100,000, which is where I want us all to be. Uh, there is, you can make trades, we'll show you how to do that. You can do research on companies that will give you financial statements and graphs and things like that. Uh, right here we see what happened in the last, um, six months or you know, the last year with Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Google. And uh, uh, all of them kind of look alike, don't they? <laughs> it's been a brutal year for anybody that's been holding uh, those stocks. But those stocks have performed incredibly well over longer periods of time. Uh, there's others. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway is there, Tesla, uh, NVIDIA, uh, and a few investment houses, medical company. You see that everybody's stock isn't going down. Uh, just those have gone down. And, and when you look at the last performance, it's gone up. You know, So all of these are, represent ups and downs. Uh, we can take uh, new training, uh, introductions, and how it works. These are all videos or tutorials of some sort. These are all free. Uh, if you sign up for a simulator, they do not do anything with your email address. You're not going to get calls from brokers. I uh, want you to open up a broker's account with them. Uh, so uh, I like them for that. Some of the others, they, they pepper you with uh, spam. And then it gives us option to join games. And there's lots and lots of games uh, that, are, that are there. Uh, there's a leaderboard of like some games that have been going for a long time. Uh, uh, thought I could go that way. I won't. We can create a game if you want to. We can join a game, and I'd like you to join a game. This is a list of games that are active now that you can compete with, and you can do that uh, on your own. Um, uh, there's 21,000 games that are underway at this point in time. They started. Uh, some of them have 
it have ended, but most of them have no end dates. Uh, you can see that first one, the beginners by simulator. There's a million people playing that game right now. Uh, and so you can do that and be one in a million. Uh, see how you perform against other people if you want to do that. We are doing a game in the house here uh, where we would uh, say join the game and look up uh, Dixie Tech. Hey, Steve, I don't know if it's my age or what, but I can't get into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? It's not your age. I can tell you that for sure. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. <laughs> so it's not that. I don't know. Is anybody else having trouble getting to this spot? Why don't you go down? I think. I can't even you. It, mine just says, it keeps taking me to a stock market simulator. Is that, like, this is what it is? I don't know who stock, that, if that's invest, Investopedia or not. Mine. I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious. Investopedia, a stock market simulator. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, yeah. You know, okay, I mean, like Brad, come over and go. Brad, I didn't make an account in order to go and see oh, what, are you logged in? I can't even. Is that the password, the capital D X A T E O? That's that's the password for uh, the laptop itself. So yeah, it, 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 it let me get in. It's D X A T C. D X A T C. Yeah, one more. <laughs> so once we get in, uh, and, and this is the Dixie Tech financial management game. You created a game. I created a game. Dixie. And it, if you if you type Dixie, it drops it down here. Dixie Tech Financial Management, and you can go to that game. That was created today. It's going to end in May. Our class will end before that. But, uh, that's the game, and it's private. Uh, so I may have to change that to public if you guys aren't able to sign. Need a password. Yeah, give us a password. We can do it. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. The password that I set that up is Dixie Tech 2023 with a capital D and a capital T. Does that get you in? Yes. So write that down. It's all on one window spaces. And you can trade just like in the real world as often as you would like. You can trade even when the market is closed, which it is right now. Um, you can, I, I, I did not allow you to trade options on this uh, game. Uh, if you join another game, you can be in multiple games uh, if you'd like to be. And uh, if you join, uh, most of the others allow options. I didn't want to confuse this with the options market that usually operates on margins, which is a whole different uh, way to lose a lot of money fast. And so I don't want us to go there now. We'll, we'll talk about it at another time. But for this, this is just flat out stock. And uh, you can you can look for a company. Uh, um, if, if, if to, to begin your trades, this is what you have. Your, everyone's account is worth uh, $100,000. It's in cash until you buy stocks. When you buy stocks, it takes 15 minutes or so to update, just like it does with your real broker. Uh, they have to go do the trade, and it take, it's not instantaneous. Uh, and uh, the price might have changed during that period of time if the market is still open. Uh, and, and so uh, when I'm ready to make a trade, I'm signed into the game. I go to trade. I can look up um, you know, Amazon. I want it gives a drop down uh, as I start to type of companies that have uh, the trading symbol uh, letters and this gives us Amazon I click on the company and it tells me now um, 
what's happened. This is this chart that it shows here. That's the chart for today only, from the open to the close of the market. So you can see the price of Amazon changed uh, from a high of 97 early uh, to a low below 94 during the day. And so these are different times during the day. It changed by, and, and day traders, by the way, that's what they're doing when they buy. They look, they try to buy at a peak right here this morning at 8.22, it was at 95, and at uh, 8.59, it was at 94. So you buy and sell and you made a dollar. You know, if, if your broker kept up with you, uh, it just means you can't go to the bathroom because the price might have changed again and you lose more money. So day trading is kind of, uh, you know, for the, the purist that wants to go 100% all in and that's all they want to do, uh, you can make money doing that. Uh, I'm not proposing it, but you can buy and sell as often as you want. Uh, you all start with $100,000. Uh, by April 1st, when this class is done, I want to see who has the most. And I will uh, buy you and your uh, significant other a steak dinner if you're the winner in this class. It's not like splitting millions of dollars in profit. <laughs> it's just dinner. Uh, but I will do that to whoever wins uh, in the class. Uh, and and uh, I'll make some trades too. I'm not going to uh, do my best. I'm going to do what is interesting because it's funny money. It's not, it's, it's not, uh, it's not real dollars. But to know what to buy, uh, you can make a buy. As soon as you buy $100,000 worth of stuff, it says you can't buy anything else until you sell something. And, and so you can put a sell order in, uh, sell maybe half your holding. If you don't know how to, uh, to invest, none of us do. Investing is a guessing game, and Warren Buffett uh, is, is one of the more well-known good ones at it, uh, but he has a lot more money to throw at it. And, and so our purpose here is, I, 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 is not to discount the luck factor. Our purpose here is to, to look at companies and think why would we think they'd be a reasonable investment. And you can Google all this. We've got a lot of smart people looking at it. You can buy, uh, in, in your investment here, you can buy a mutual fund or a collection of other stocks that uh, is indexed to, to something. It could be indexed to oil prices. It could be indexed to, uh, uh, to COVID-related products. It could be indexed to anything that somebody has put an investment uh, instrument together uh, you can you can buy those just like you can in the very very real world, and and so I'll keep track a little bit of how our winners are are, are floating around. You don't have to buy or sell every day, uh, but I do want you not to keep the hundred thousand dollars in cash. Uh, that's generally not the best investment. Uh, however, uh, you can lose <laughs> you can lose money doing this as well. So uh, I'd like you to. To consider that, and if you want to partner up with somebody else and, and go go together, uh, uh, you're welcome to do that. Just however you want to choose to do it. Any uh -huh. questions about getting signed in and logged in, or what we're doing? <coughs> okay, I'll check with you on Tuesday and see if anybody's having uh, difficulty, and I will see uh, if uh, we all at least are actively investing in in. in uh, uh, we, at some point, will have a little bit of a recap of what have we bought and why did we buy it. And, and uh, I'd like you to be prepared. If your reason is you looked it up and somebody on or some brokerage house said that was a great investment, that's fine. Just document where your information came from as to why you invested where you, where you did. <coughs> so I'll further ask, why do you trust them? What's the record been? You know, are they are they trustworthy? Are they do they have a track record? Do they know more than you know? It's chance. There's a chance they don't. And and so if you say I invested them because I looked at their numbers and they got a lot of cash in the company, or they announced they're going to do this with uh, their money. You know, Facebook made an announcement about six months ago, and their market, their stock value plummeted because the the market said. I don't think we agree with what you announced you were going to do. And so everything Zuckerberg has done hasn't turned into gold. 
and and um, uh, in, in, in fact, they're facing a, a fair number of, of questions at this point in time from the public market. So, why would you put your money into this company? That's more of what I want us to have an understanding. Of. What do you like about them? Is it the product, or do you like something? Uh, their financial statements are available here. But just click it. You don't have to do. You don't have to leave this uh, investor view. They've got the, the charts and the uh, ratios and the things. Whatever it is that you pick up on, if you like retained earnings, as we talked about, uh, that, you, that you, you like the trend on retained earnings, this will give you that information and you can make an investment choice based on that. So with that, uh, that's enough for class on this. I want to wrap up with a couple videos that talk about we're going we're gonna, to, we focused on the balance sheet today. We will look at uh, the income statement, of course, uh, in another class. Uh, right now, we're going to look at uh, uh, two videos, uh, and that probably will take us uh, through the class on the one on on uh, the, the the task we have at hand of buying and selling some stocks. And and by the way, with this, you can put a short. Uh, you can short a stock, just like you can on the market. If you don't know what that means or you've never done it, look it up. It means you are selling something, betting on it, get the price going down. And so if you see a company that's in a train wreck, and if the market hasn't already halted on that, that stock, you can buy it and short it, uh, meaning that you want to make a profit on them losing further value. Uh, that's a legitimate way to invest. Uh, it's, uh, it's risky like all of them. Right? It's not any more or less risky. Uh, all of it is a guessing game, uh, and I'd like to see if you have some data on it. Otherwise, we should just go to Mesquite and put money in red and black, right? And maybe you can make money that way, too. Uh, that it might be more fun, actually. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's take a look. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look at how Warren Buffett uh, uh, considers the people that make mistakes, what they look at and what he doesn't look at. So we're going we're gonna to watch a video on that. But first, we're going to wa watch one on the idea of analyzing financial statements. So what do we look at as we analyze a financial statement? And this is from an accounting guy. This is so he's talking to us that aren't accounting guys. But this is he's been a controller of a company. And so we'll take a look at this. He's going to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, Tesla as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll watch that. Critical analysis. And then the third is going to be a ratio analysis, which means that you're comparing two financial figures on your financial statements to each other. So I layer in my results for the three months, right? And then I have the change from the most two recent month, March to February, and then a change in terms of percentage. Hey guys, welcome back to another Sorry, video with the financial that. controller, Bill Hanna here. Sorry. In today's video, we'll be discussing financial statement analysis and the types of analyses that I perform as a corporate controller. So there are four main types. We'll be going through an overview of these analyses and then we'll discuss each one in more detail. So let's dive in and take a look. All right, so as an overview of financial statement analysis, there are two main categories of analysis. There is accounting analysis, which is the purpose of it is to find accounting errors. And then there is financial or managerial analysis, which is the purpose of which is to help make business decisions. So with accounting analysis, the most common type is gonna be month over month analysis, which we call horizontal analysis. The reason why we're calling it horizontal is because we're going horizontally from left to right, comparing a period to the next and looking at the change and the change percentage and commenting on these changing and trying to figure out if there are accounting errors because this is the whole purpose of this thing is to find accounting errors. Right. And then the second category is going to be financial or managerial analysis, which uh, breaks down to three types. And the purpose of all of them is to help make business decisions. Right. So these are going to be more uh, strategic in nature. So the first one is going to be actual to budget, where we'll be going through the actual results and comparing it to the budget and looking at the change and commenting. And pretty much this analysis will drive uh, what kind of changes we need to make to future, uh, for example, spending to figure out the best way to uh, run the company more efficiently. This is actual to budget. 
Uh, the second one is going to be vertical analysis. So vertical is as opposed to horizontal. So remember, here we said horizontal, we're looking left to right. Well, with vertical, we're going top to bottom, right? And the reason is that we're uh, measuring line items on, say, the income statement as a percentage of one of the line items on the income statement. Most commonly, you're measuring expenses uh, to the revenue as a percentage, right? So we'll go through that as an example in a minute. This is vertical analysis. And then the third is gonna be a race. Thank you, uh, just pause for a second. On the vertical analysis, if I'm, give you an example, if, I, if I'm looking at a restaurant's financial statements, uh, I'm gonna go to their income statement, and there's a magic number that is just my magic number, and I don't know that it's, that it's an industry's magic number, but my magic number is I will look at how much they spend on food buying raw food from the provisioners from Cisco or whoever their source is for the food that they sell that goes into the restaurant. I will look at that all together, the amount of food they bought. If it's more than 38% of the food they sold, the dollars that they sold, they're spending too much on food or they're throwing too much food away. So they're buying food, they're not actually converting into sandwiches or meals that they sell. And that's pretty true for just about every kind of restaurant that I've, I've had the experience of looking at. And those numbers would be a different number for your business based on what your business, I'm looking at excavation. There's, the raw materials is not the main part of your cost, it's other stuff. And, 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 and uh, um, so we look at efficiency based on another number and the vertical analysis based on the industry that we're looking at. So there's some rules of thumb that we would find for your kind of business Structural steel is a large industry in the United States. We have two people in this class that are in the structural steel uh, arena. So that company's performance is easy to compare with other national companies to see some of these vertically, some of these percentages. What percent does s, &S steel spend on uh, uh, grinding and blasting and, and versus other competitors? So that's a prep thing going into before you're welding. And, and are we in line with what others, a good restaurant vending, look at that number. But in doing an analysis, that should be lined out. The cost of, of beam preparation is a cost that I might have to dig for, but I can see if we're in line or not in line. And maybe it's one of the major costs because it adds no value. If you weld well in the first place, you don't have to clean it up. Hey, right? Steve, I have a question sure. on that problem. So, <laughs> Where would be a place, because, yeah, I have some excavation buddies, but they really don't want to show me their income statement or their financial statement or what. So where are some sources, avenues you can go to maybe find some of those analysis? Yeah. Or the, I, I love the question because that's the part that excites me the most is that we aren't in the blind and our banks know where to go and most of the time we don't. So we don't know until we go in and talk to the bank and then they bust us. And we're going, well, hold on a second. Um, one of the one of the places uh, that we will we, we will spend several classes talking about this, okay. and we'll pass them out. I'll show you how to read them, and this become will be one of the biggest tools that we'll have because we need to know what are other structural steels doing, what are other gravel pits doing, you know, and and how do they, uh, auto dealers? If you're a, if you're a car lot, you don't want to compare to a hardware store. You want to compare to another hard uh, car lot. So. The, there's a national company that's called RMA, and RMA Data is, is they, they are the, one of the, they're not the only one, but they're one of them that, that, that I use, and that did, at one point in time it stood for Robert Morris and Associates, and they later uh, uh, call it RMA, and RMA publishes data uh, that looks at companies by, uh, by SIC code, SIC code, and then it looks at them by uh, gross volume, dollar volume, and it looks at them by uh, assets. So you can compare companies that have as many assets to you. Uh, those aren't always the same companies that are selling the same amount of, of top line dollars that you're selling. But we gotta know that data. Spot on question, I'm glad you're thinking in that term. And, and we're gonna dig it up for each kind of industry that wants it here in this class, and we'll go through that so you'll have a tool to take home to look at your real numbers. Yeah, so I think that's super, uh, that, that's super valuable because uh, otherwise we've got our eyes closed. We're going to die. That's no good. 
All right, I didn't mean to cut this guy off. Let's go back to Show analysis, which means that you're comparing two financial figures on your financial statements to each other uh, and getting the result as a percentage or a ratio. Uh, the most common example here, for example, is current ratio. Current ratio looks at the uh, ratio between your current assets and current liabilities to figure out whether the company has sufficient funding to meet its short-term obligations. So we're gonna go ahead and go through an example of each of these analyses here in a minute. But if you're new to the channel, my name is Bill Hanna. I'm a corporate controller and a licensed CPA in the great state of New York. And the purpose of this channel is to give you the summary and pretty much the juice of my experience over the last maybe 15 to 17 years working in accounting and finance in this channel. So if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe uh, to the channel. And if you like the subject of this video, give us a thumbs up. That will help the channel reach more viewers. Thank you in advance. I also teach this specific topic on analysis and accounting in general in the Controller Academy. I'm gonna leave a link down below. Okay, so we jump back in and we said, we have four types of analyses that I perform as a corporate controller. One is an accounting analysis, and then three of them are gonna be financial or managerial analyses, right? And if you stick around till the end, I'm gonna tell you exactly out of these four, which are the most commonly used types of analyses that are must have for any corporate controller. All right, so let's take a look at the first one and how I set up my analysis in Excel for my month over month comparison for a horizontal accounting analysis. All right, so this is my setup in Excel and this is for a business called Spa Booker. And Spa Booker, it's important to understand what kind of business they're in for you to understand how to analyze the income statement. So Spa Booker is a platform, an online marketplace that connects the consumer on one end and then the spas on the other end um, where the consumer can go in, in the mobile app and set up an appointment for a spa treatment. It's very similar to the concept of Uber or Lyft. Uh, so it's an online marketplace. And then Spa Booker sits in between the consumer and the spa place uh, and makes a commission on each of these transactions, right? So let's jump back in. All right, so we got the income statement uh, for three months, for January, February, and March, right? And I like to have three months periods where I'm comparing March to February, but then I like to have January also as further context. So for example, you know, if I see that my revenue went up by 22% in platform fee between March and February, I also had like to have January in here so that I can have further context into what happened in January, and then I can see the story of how the revenue is developing month over month, right? So I layer in my results for the three months, right? And then I have the change from the most two recent month, March to February, and then a change in terms of percentage, right? And then I have here my comment column where I'm, where I'm providing my commentary. And remember, the whole purpose of this whole analysis here is to find accounting mistakes, right? So you're not so much or necessarily defending these numbers. Uh, you are trying to objectively analyze the numbers and find accounting mistakes. And if you find an accounting mistake, then you just gotta go and fix it. Right, nothing bad here. Is that you finding accounting errors that could happen during the month in close, and then going back to fix them? I did that with a uh, medical practice here in St. George, uh, plastic surgeon. Uh, some of you would know the name of. Uh, well, well respected, well known. We're looking at uh, their numbers as a practice to look at their, uh, you know, how could they run their business a little tighter. Uh, two physicians in, in the group. And uh, in running this analysis, we find out that one of the more common procedures that they do, they do tummy tucks and, and all kinds of plastic surgery procedures, uh, esthetician kind of stuff, uh, and they do uh, breast augmentation. And it turns out that they were billing for a long period of time for one instead of two. <laughs> I gotta just leave a pause there for that. It's like, really? The, and they did it for more than one year, multiple years. The practice was billing half as much as they could have been billing for breast augmentation. On rare occasions, they do one when there's you know, uh, cancerous reconstruction or car accident or something like that. But most of the time, it's two at a time. And to miss in your counting team that's unbelievable. And nobody, the doctors, they do doctor. They don't do books. They don't do looking at the numbers. They don't do analysis that say, 
Is there an obvious mistake here? Uh, that one, I think, is just almost hilarious. They were still okay financially, but they left a lot of money on the table, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so in the commentary, I'd like to have a threshold for analysis. So, for example, here I say that comment is required for changes over 10%. And this is something you can decide in your company, with your team, with your leadership, uh, figure out, speak to your CFO, your controller, figure out what is the threshold that is going to be worth your time investigating, right? Because you don't want to be spending time investigating $5 or $10, right? You want to be going over the big guys, right? Um, so figure out the threshold. In some companies, I've seen that being 2%, maybe 5%. Um, in some companies where it's a smaller company, it's 10%. Just figure out the percentage that makes sense, and then go over the commentary over the variances that are over this percentage. So in this case here, we set up 10%. And also I like to layer in my headcount information. So headcount information is gonna help me, um, it's gonna help drive the um, changes that I see in payroll or some of the other cost accounts that are associated with headcount. So for example, uh, January headcount was 26, it went up to 32, it went up to 38. Um, you know, the change month over month is six, which is 19%. So pretty much I should expect that my payroll costs are gonna be moving in the same direction but if I see them moving in a different direction, then I'm gonna be stopping here and saying, wait a minute, you know, it doesn't make sense for payroll to be changing in a much bigger or smaller difference than uh, my headcount information. So when I begin analyzing the income statement account by account, so I begin with the first line on the revenue, which is platform fees, and I can see that went up by 22%, right? So my commentary on this is to review the sales by customer report for reasonableness, uh, and then uh, provide the a commentary that I've reviewed it and asked the question. So for example, when we look at this tab here that we set up for sales by customer, I can see the trend line on how my buy account, my revenue is going up month over month, right? So my commentary is gonna be that I asked the question, uh, looked at the detail by customer and asked the question uh, within the sales team and figure out if it's reasonable for revenue to go up by that percentage. Right, and generally revenue should go up month over month. Right, if you see it going down, then it's a sign of trouble overall. Uh, but in this case here, it is trending correctly and going up month over month. And as I continue to go through the income statement, I'm going to start going through some of the cost of sales item. And the first one is going to be a server cost. And a server cost in this case is with AWS or Amazon Web Services. And as you might imagine, any business that relies on web traffic, such as Spotbooker. Uh, as revenue goes up, you also should expect that your uh, server costs should start going up as well. So we see here that uh, the web cost or the web hosting cost went up by 7%, right? And uh, we'll say here that this is in line with change in revenue. Even though we see change in revenue is 17%, uh, the increase here is 7%, which is good because you want your revenue change to outpace your cost, right? And that makes sense. And now, as we go down uh, through the statement, we'll see some items such as the uh, salaries and benefits to customer support. And you'll see that all of these accounts went up by 20% month over month. So this is an increase of 20%. And this is why it's helpful to have the headcount information trending up here, so that I can see, for example, the headcount went up by 19%. Right, and the payroll uh, cost went up by 20%, so it's in line, right? Uh, but remember, the whole reason for this analysis here is for you to find mistakes, right? So if this trending here is not 20%, say it's 30% or 40%, then you, that means something is wrong, right? So you're not necessarily defending these numbers that you're seeing in the income statement. You're trying to find that there's any kind of correlation that doesn't make sense that will indicate that you might have an accounting error, which is the whole purpose of this analysis. Okay, so this here is a, a good number to see 20% correlates to 19%, right? If it's not correlating, you have to go back and figure out if there is a mistake in the way you booked payroll, right? Uh, so I'm gonna comment here and say that increase is in line with increase in headcount. And you pretty much go through the rest of the income statement and look at the increases that are over 10% and provide commentary uh, on the change month over month, and again, you're not defending, but rather trying to find if there is an accounting mistake. All right, so back to this overview of the types of financial statement analysis. We just covered the accounting analysis month over month to find accounting errors. Now, let's take a look at the financial or managerial analyses. The first one is gonna be actual versus budget. Let's take a look at how I set up my file. All right, so in Excel here, I'm analyzing the P&L 
for spot book order for March of 2022, and I have a column for actual results, and I have a column for budget, right? So I'm gonna layer in my actual by account, and then I'm gonna layer in the budget, and then I'm gonna have a column for variance dollars and various uh, percentage. And then I'm gonna do the same thing where I'm gonna put my headcount information at the first row uh, to show what is the actual headcount versus budget. And then the variance is four and that's 12%, which means that hiring is ahead of plan, right? And I have a tab here for my headcount information, so I'm gonna show you in a second, if I flip over to headcount, right? I have my actual headcount data, and I have my budget by department, right? So the way to look at this is, for example, the budget for customer support was to have six headcount in March, but in actuality, I have seven, right? So that tells me that I'm hiring ahead of budget or more than budget. Right. If I flip back to the profit and loss statement, uh, this is going to be a guiding number for me to know uh, where I stand in terms of uh, hiring for budget versus actual. And just like I did before, I'm going to provide a threshold for commentary because I don't want to analyze every single dollar on the income statement. Right. I want to go after the things that are more impactful. I want to spend my time wisely. If you have a bigger team and you have the resources, maybe lower that threshold to maybe two or three percent. But in this case here, I'm setting it at 10% because I'm gonna be spending my time efficiently on the things that have the bigger impact on the PL. And now I can begin analyzing my accounts one by one. So I'll begin with my revenue accounts and I have the first one, platform fees. And I'll see here that my actual to budget, I am behind budget by $14,000 or 12%, right? Uh, so that's gonna be something that I have to comment on. And the way I'm gonna comment on this one is that I'm gonna speak with my sales team and figure out um, why are we behind plan? So when I speak to them, you know, they told me that the slight lag versus budget is due to list number of stores signing up versus planned, right? So you can examine that and make sure that it's, that statement is correct by looking at the way the budget is built and the number of stores that are being signed up and compare it to actual number of stores and see if that statement is true, right? This is how you analyze this kind of number. Uh, the transaction fee is off from budget by 4%, so it's below my threshold of investigation, so I'm not gonna go through it. Uh, but if you set up your threshold to be 3%, then you'll have to comment on this item here by investigating further. And you do the same thing going down the list, right? So you go through the accounts, you know, your cost of sales, your server cost, uh, this is AWS cost, right? It's lagging behind budget, below budget by 5%, which is good, uh, because you want it to correlate with revenue, right? So revenue is down by 5%, and so is your cost with AWS down by 5%, which makes sense, because there is a correlation between the traffic and the hosting fees with AWS. Now, when you look at your uh, accounts for salaries and benefit to customer support, in this case, right, it's down, or actually rather it's up by 12%, right? And that's why it's helpful to have the headcount budget versus actual on top here, so that you see that you're ahead of budget by 12%, and so is your cost is also ahead of your budget by 12%, and that makes sense. Um, and then you go through pretty much the rest of the statement and go account by account and provide commentary in the same way by investigating why the budget is different than actual and provide a commentary. And then this pretty much is gonna help management make decisions in the business uh, going forward, whether we need to uh, reduce the resources being spent in certain areas, uh, invest more in selling in certain areas, so on and so forth this is how you analyze actual versus budget. All right, the next analysis is gonna be vertical analysis. And before discussing why even it's called vertical analysis, I wanted to give a big shout out to my Patreon supporters. I'm gonna leave uh, a screenshot here for my supporters. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the channel. And Patreon pretty much is a place where we meet once a month and you can chat with me on Discord via voice chat and ask me your questions. We discuss things that vary from financial statement questions to career development, uh, even questions whether you should leave your job and go to another job, things like that that we discuss. Uh, so go ahead, I'm gonna leave a link down below to Patreon where I also leave valuable Excel files and downloads that you can go ahead and check out. But let's dive back in. We're talking about vertical analysis, right? So for vertical analysis, the reason why it's called vertical, remember, we just said horizontal here on the left. Horizontal was going left to right and comparing period over period, right? Um, with vertical, we're going top to bottom. That's why it's called vertical, 
to make sense. Um, so you're in vertical, I'll show you the setup in Excel in a second, but you pretty much are comparing some of the items on the income statement uh, to one fixed item such as revenue, most commonly done this way. Um, and then looking at you know, whether you are, as a percentage of revenue, for example, uh, you're trending up or down on these expenses. So let's take a look on the Excel file and how I set it up for this kind of analysis. All right, so for vertical income statement analysis, what I do is I layer in my income statement by account for three months. So I have here January, February, and March. And then I create three columns here where I measure each line item as a percentage of revenue. So obviously revenue as a percentage of itself is 100%. Uh, but then as you go down the cost of sales accounts, for example, so server cost, right? Um, when you look at it as a percentage of revenue, you're simply just dividing the server cost as a percentage of total revenue, uh, and that gives you 21%, right? And what you wanna see is that you wanna see, for example, server cost, you wanna see improvement, right? So this one here, that's why I highlighted in green, because I'm seeing a good trend line, right? You don't wanna see this one going from like 20%, 21% to 19, you know, to like 30%. You don't want that. You would, that would be uh, something that you highlight in red. Uh, in this case here, it's actually a good trend where uh, the percent, as a percentage, of my server cost um, is going down as a percentage of revenue. Uh, same thing here, I'm gonna highlight the salaries to customer support, which is trending down as a percentage of revenue which tells me that I'm able to support uh, the growing revenue with less cost or you know, maybe fixing my cost in terms of headcount um, for customer support, which is a good thing. So I wanna highlight the success. And then also I wanna highlight any kind of you know, red flags. So for example, as I scroll down, you know, hotels, for example, uh, the amount to spend as a percentage of revenue went up from 3% to 4%. And although it's not a big increase, it's just an example I wanna show you that's where you can see trend lines that are not trending in, in the right direction and you wanna highlight that um, and discuss it with your management to figure out where are the areas that you can improve in the business. And this is the whole purpose of this vertical analysis is to highlight the areas that needs improvement um, in the P&L. All right, so going back to the overview, we've covered three types of analyses and accounting analysis and then we covered actual versus budget vertical analysis. And now we'll take a look at ratio analysis. So the reason why ratio analysis is helpful is because it compares two financial figures to each other and gives you uh, the result in terms of a percentage or a ratio. So an example is current ratio. So current ratio measures the relationship between current assets and current liabilities uh, and gives you the result in terms of ratio. The higher the ratio, the better, because that means that you have enough current assets to cover your near-term obligations and current liabilities. Um, and so it's a really helpful way to look at the business because it gives you a quick way of understanding where you stand and some of these things, profitability, liquidity, insolvency. So let's take a look at how I set up my file uh, for this kind of analysis. All right, so in terms of setup in the Excel file, I go ahead and list my uh, ratios. So I selected a couple of uh, profitability ratios, gross margin, operating margin, liquidity ratio, such as current ratio, and then a couple of solvency ratios. And you know, I like to always list the purpose of these ratios for anyone who's reading the file to understand what I'm doing, um, and then the formula, and then the results for January, March, February, and March, and kind of you know go to the right here and measure each month, so I can establish a trend line um, for these results. So for the first one, gross margin, for example, uh, that shows the amount of profit uh, before deducting selling general and admin expenses and it takes gross profit divided by gross revenue and spits out the result in terms of percentage. Um, you know, in January it was a negative 14%, and then it begins to trend up in Feb to 29, and then to 30% in March. Um, and the goal is 60%, and the goal is something that you can set up by speaking to your leadership in the company and also discussing in terms of industry. So in this case here, this is a software company and it's common to have a gross margin close to 60%. And so that's what I'm gonna set up the goal here to be 60%. And I wanna see this number trending closer to 60% uh, in the future. And to make it easy for myself, I put a couple of tabs in here, one for profit and loss and one for the balance sheet. So I can easily just link these numbers gross profit divided by revenue, and I can get my result here and display it here on the right. So you can set up your ratio analysis in this simplistic view that you see right here, or you can set up a more sophisticated 
KPI dashboard like the one that you can download on my website. I'm gonna leave a link down below to the controller KPI dashboard, um, which is something that you can set up and it's easy to navigate where you can change the month and that will change the results. Um, you can go ahead and check out the link down below. I'll teach you how to create it and you can download a finished product which you can customize to your needs. Uh, or you can just set up this simplistic view which is pretty good. Um, it will go from gross margin to operating margin, uh, measuring each month, the trend line, and then also showing the goal. Um, I have here liquidity ratio, current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities, uh, giving me a number, and then I'm gonna have a goal. Uh, so the goal always with current um, ratio is to have more than one, because that means that you have much more than your current liabilities and current assets. So that means that you can meet your uh, current or uh, near-term obligations of the company. With the solvency ratios, we've got debt to equity ratio, um, which is the relative proportion um, in equity that is financed by uh, liabilities. So for example, liabilities divided by equity gives you 15%, and that means that 15% of the company's business is financed by uh, liabilities versus equity, which is good. You want that to be less than one, uh, otherwise the company can be uh, too leveraged into liabilities. And then you have financial leverage, which looks at the total assets divided by total equity. And then you provide your goal and your explanation of the ratio. So this is a quick way to kind of set up a ratio analysis for the company. Uh, again, I use either this view here, which is simplistic, or a more sophisticated dashboard view here, which I'm going to leave a link down below to as well. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm going to share with you the common analyses that I use at month end. So out of all these four analyses, the ones that I rely on each month is going to be this first one here, accounting analysis to find accounting error month over month. This is going to be a stable analysis for me each month. And the second one is going to be actual versus budget. This is something that I do every month. Uh, so these first two are the two that I rely on the most. Uh, with vertical and ratio analysis, I would only do if I have the resources, enough people on my team to conduct the analyses. Um, if I don't have time for these two or resources, I will always default to these first two. These are the most helpful because the first one tells me um, if I'm making accounting mistakes, and the second one tells me how I'm spending or operating compared to budget, because the budget is the um, basically the north star for the company and what I need to stick to and um, if I'm underperforming against budget, I need to figure out why. Or if I'm overperforming, you also it's good to find out why you're overperforming so that you can learn from the company's results. Uh, so these are the two results or two um, analyses that I rely on each month. Thank you so much for watching. And if you found this video helpful, go ahead. So we're gonna uh, watch the, something else that he teaches in another class, because uh, I think he explains it very well. The template that he has, there are tons of those out there. You know, you, if you like the idea, you can download it. It's free. Uh, there are tons of other free ones out there that uh, you can use to look at. Uh, that give you color coded. You know, red for uh, you're in trouble, or in green for it's okay. Every business owner should be doing this, not relying on their bookkeeper or their accounting team to do it. The I mean, the, the accounting team should also do it. Make sure that the owner knows it. Uh, but the owner or the manager or the person's in charge should be doing that regularly with the financial numbers that are not the year end, but regularly. In this case, quarterly or uh, uh, monthly is what he's looking at. That's a good. That's a good place to start. The business is uh, in tighter shape. Maybe look at it more often. But uh, the at least monthly to kind of look where is the company driving. And first of all. Uh, you said that the, he said the first set of analysis to look for mistakes. If there's obvious mistakes, pick them up when you can fix them, right? Uh, nobody intends to make mistakes; they just happen. And and posting errors uh, can cause you major tax problems and major headaches, uh, like running out of money and not understanding or knowing why you're running out of money or you ran out of money. Uh, it was there, but there was a mistake that blurred it for you. And so, uh, getting to know that stuff. Uh, it's surprising to me how many business owners don't have a handle on just that very simple thing that we just looked at. Secondly, there's an awful lot of business owners that can't do the second one because they don't have a budget. They're just working as hard as they can work every day, do as good as they can do, and not really knowing what they're planning and not having a planned budget of where they want to be. And, and a company needs to know 
where they want to be after you hire the first employee. When you are just a sole proprietorship and it's just you, it's your game, you can wing it, play it by the seat of your pants if you want, no other families are depending on you, uh, just go for it. But as soon as, other, as soon as you have employees, you have other families that are depending on your uh, effectiveness and being able to sustain a company. And so part of sustaining a company is having the budgets and knowing where we need to be in order to be solvent. Because at some point in time when an accounting firm does give us a financial opinion of an audit of our books, which if we're not a public company, that can be a, you know, it can be a, a non-public accounting firm, but it's got to be a hands, uh, arm's length accounting firm that gives us a financial statement or the IRS will give you theirs. And you don't want that. You want one that's a, an opinion by a certified public accounting firm, even if they're not uh, licensed to do public companies, uh, they can do private companies and they will give an opinion statement that's part of your financial statements that says in that opinion statement, in our opinion, this company is solvent or it can, can sustain continued operations or this company is insolvent. And you don't want an accounting uh, letter that says you're insolvent. Now that's, that's a problem because you probably are near insolvency at that point, which means you're near bankruptcy. Uh, so the first step is learning how to read financial statements and reading, right? And so he started that, that conversation. Uh, the second step will be now what can we do to change the financial statements to be more favorable? to where we're going and what we want to do to grow the company or to take more profits out of the company. And that, we'll be talking about that uh, later. I want to end the class with uh, some investment um, opinion from Warren Buffett because we're starting our little investment game. So how does he pick stocks? How does he pick companies? What does he think the mistakes are that companies make that cause them not to be on his list of companies that he likes to invest in? And, and uh, so there's something of value there of how he takes apart a financial statement. We'll watch this, and then we'll be done uh, when this is over. Uh, I'll comment on it a little bit, but we'll be done. In this video, you learn about 12 of the biggest mistakes that almost every investor makes, according to Warren Buffett. I'll admit a few of my own investing sins along the way to be a good sport. This is the Swedish investor bringing you the best tips and tools for reaching financial freedom through stock market investing. Number one, timing the market. Well, we don't, Charlie and I don't think about the market, and, and, I, and Ben didn't very much, he, I think he made a mistake to occasionally try and place a value on it. Uh, we look at individual businesses, but the, the stock market, I know of no one that has been successful at, uh, and, and really made a lot of money predicting the actions of the market itself. I know a lot of people who have done well uh, uh, picking businesses, and that's what we're hoping to do. Focusing too much on what the general stock market is doing is one thing that Warren Buffett considers a great mistake. One so easy to commit that even his investing role model Benjamin Graham was doing it. Why is predicting market movements so alluring? The tide of the ocean can both raise and sink all ships. You successfully identified a great stock, but got clobbered because COVID struck. Then you found another awesome company, only to face raising interest rates, inflation and war. What the hell? I think this is why trying to predict what happens on a macro level in the economy is so alluring. We want to buy the dips and sell the highs. It sounds so easy, right? Warren Buffett says that one must only focus on two things in life, the important and the knowable. Where the market is heading sure is important, but is it knowable? I don't know what interest rate hike Jeremy Powell will announce during Fed's next policy meeting. Heck, I don't even think that Jeremy Powell himself knows that. And that's just one of maybe 100 variables that are important for where the market is heading. So what is Buffett doing instead? He is focusing on what is both important and knowable, identifying superior companies at fair prices. Recognizing that a ship is superior is a lot easier than predicting every storm that may come far, far into the future. Sometimes there will be hurricanes and thunder, 
and one of your ships may sink, but at other times your ships will have wind in their back. Trust that, over time, you'll do well by betting on the best boats. Number two, getting attached to your purchasing price. A stock at 50, somebody's paid 100, they feel terrible, somebody else paid 10, they feel wonderful, all these feelings. And it, it has no impact whatsoever. Have a look at this graph, which represents the share price of Amazon during the last five years. Arnold purchased the stock in June 2022, and he's now sitting on a nice 5% return. Not too shabby, he probably feels pretty good about himself, considering that that was only some four months ago. On the other hand, Ben purchased the company in July 2021, and he has lost 38%. And then there's Katie, who purchased Amazon five years ago, and she's now sitting on a nice 133% return. Now to the million dollar question. Does this all matter? Should Arnold, Ben, and Katie treat Amazon stock differently because of when they purchased the company? Maybe Arnold and Katie should sell to secure a profit while Ben should wait to break even? Presented like this, I think it is quite easy to see that the answer to this question is no. The only thing that matters for today's decision, selling or keeping Amazon, is how the company is likely to perform in the future. After all, if Amazon sells for 50% more in a year, Arnold, Ben and Katie will all make a 50% profit from today's level. They are not treated differently. The mistake here is that many investors tend to get attached to their purchasing price. The stock of Amazon doesn't give a damn about your purchasing price. Stocks do not show empathy. They treat investors who have lost 38% on their holding and those that have gained 133% exactly the same going forward. Warren Buffett thinks that you should always pretend that you have a blank slate. You'll soon hear about a sibling to this mistake, a mistake that Buffett calls his biggest mistake by far. Number three, aggressive growth projections. I think it's a mistake for any company to predict 15% a year growth, but plenty of them do. Very, very few large companies can compound their earnings at 15%. It isn't gonna happen. Have you ever thought to yourself, hmm, this stock looks quite expensive, but if it can just keep growing its earnings like this, it will soon be a bargain. I sure have. Many companies with high valuations in the stock market try to defend their share price by forecasting astonishing growth. But, as Buffett points out, expecting very high growth rates is a mistake. I'm certainly not advising that you should stay away from growing companies. Buffett loves to invest in companies that can grow, especially if they can do so without the need for too much capital. But growth at any price, which has been the mentality on Wall Street during these times of low interest rates, that is a trap. Anytime you purchase a stock at, say, 20 times earnings or more, you need earnings to grow quite drastically to achieve a nice return. And, as Buffett points out, this is not so easy to do. Among S&P 500 companies from 2012 that still exist under the same ticker symbol today, only 40 companies managed to grow at 15% or more. That's about 1 in 10. It's very difficult to pick out a 1 in 10 company. Investors in the Teslas, Intuits, and NVIDIAs of the world, beware. Number four, using a lot of leverage. Really the only way a smart person who's reasonably disciplined in how they look at investments can get in trouble is through leverage. I mean, if, if somebody else can pull the plug on you during the worst moment of some kind of general financial disaster, you go broke. And Charlie and I both have friends that have, where that's happened to them. Using a lot of leverage is the financial equivalent of playing Russian roulette. Sure, I'd gladly accept a one in six risk of blowing my brains out. Investing really isn't a game that was created for the impatient. And nothing screams desperate like a portfolio full of borrowed money. Except maybe really playing Russian roulette, of course. Why is leverage so dangerous? It's because if you are borrowing money, you can be right about something, but you are not allowed to play your hand, so you lose anyways. Let me explain. Harry, the hedge fund manager, decides to short GameStop on March 15, 2022. When Harry is shorting GameStop, he is using leverage, but he's borrowing shares instead of cash. 
Warren Buffett hates shorting for the same reason that he hates most leverage. Harry borrows and sells shares worth $1 million and deposits $500,000 in initial margin requirement, something the broker wants him to have in his account because they want to be sure that he can return those shares in the future. GameStop is valued at no less than 20 times its best performing year in a decade, and the business has been facing a terrible headwind during the last five or six years. In other words, Harry is sitting on a pretty good hand. Maybe not pocket aces, but perhaps pocket queens? Well, no matter. He's never going to be allowed to play that hand. Just a week later, the shares in GameStop climbs from $19 to $31 per share. Harry now owes his broker more than $1.6 million in GameStop shares. Plus, he needs to put up something called maintenance margin requirement. In total, around $2.1 million. This is when his broker issues a margin call of $600,000, money that Harry must transfer to his account for the broker to be comfortable keeping that position. Harry adds the money, but just a week later, the shares sell for $47. He now owes the broker almost $2.5 million in GameStop shares, and, you guessed it, they issue another margin call. This time, it's for $1.1 million, which is more than Harry can afford. So instead, he's forced to buy back shares, and he decides to close the whole position at a $1.5 million loss. In my opinion, the share of GameStop is trading at way too high a level currently, and I think that the imaginary Harry will be proven right, eventually. But because he used leverage, he's never going to be able to profit from that prediction. Number 5. Missing the forest for the trees. We made plenty of mistakes in acquisitions. Plenty. The mistakes are always about making an improper assessment of the economic conditions in the future of the industry of the company. They're not a bad lease. They're not a specific labor contract. They're not a questionable patent. Those are not the things that count. Three things. The future economics of the business and industry. The management. The price. If you get these three things right, you don't have to worry about every detail of a business. Warren Buffett is said to be able to make a deal in 15 minutes. This is of course partly an effect of tons and tons of business experience, but it is also because he likes to keep things simple. In 15 minutes, he can't possibly understand every detail of a business, the typical due diligence that investment bankers and management consultants spend endless hours on, but he can decide on the previous three. And, at the end of the day, that's what counts. Get caught up in too much detail, and you might miss the forest for the trees. This is probably the mistake on this list that I myself find the most difficult currently. I just spent over a month researching different stock market companies, and because of that, I was not able to release any videos for you guys on this YouTube channel. It might be that I'm getting bogged down in too much detail. However, if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that it's great to have a bottom-up approach, meaning that I sometimes do quite a bit of detailed analysis, but then I try to summarize that information for myself in the end. For example, this is what maybe a day or so of analyzing a Swedish kitchen producer called Novia ended up looking like. I've tried to give each of my categories, growth, business, and management, a one to five grade, while just jotting down the most important stuff in each category. This, together with a graph representing the cash flows of the company, and what I think that the company is currently yielding gives a great representation of the opportunity it presents, I think. Then I just compare this with the other companies that I've analyzed and pick out the ones that I think have the greatest prospects. Number six, <coughs> jumping over seven foot bars. Some businesses are a lot easier to understand than others. And Charlie and I don't like difficult problems. You know, I mean, we, we'd rather multiply by three than by pi. I mean, it's just easier for us. <laughs> Some people think that if you jump over a seven-foot bar, that the ribbon they pin on you is going to be worth more money than if you step over a one-foot bar. And it just isn't true in the investment world at, uh, at all. I think committing this mistake is so common because it completely goes against what success means in many other endeavors of life. Climbing impossible mountains, jumping impossible heights, solving impossible equations, you name it. Everywhere else, you are rewarded for doing the difficult stuff. But in the investment world, it just isn't so. 
doing complicated mathematical acrobatics or difficult predictions about the futures of industries is not only not rewarding, but often disastrous for investment results. Just ask the math geniuses and Nobel laureates at long-term capital management. This relates back to the mistake of missing the forest for the trees. If you can find a company with favorable industry and business prospects, where the management is honest and hardworking, and you don't pay too much for that business, you are bound to do well. Simple ideas yield exceptional results in the long run in the investment world. Number seven, shrinking your universe of opportunities. We think the most logical fund is the one we have at Berkshire where essentially we can do anything that makes sense and are not compelled to do anything that we don't think makes sense. I think it's a mistake to shrink the universe of possibilities. Ours is shrunk simply by size, but we don't try to, we don't set out to circumscribe our actions in any way. I've been fishing for most of my life because my father is a great fishing enthusiast. One thing that I've noticed my father doing is that he never spends too much time in the same place. If he doesn't yield any fish, he moves on to another spot. Had he been stubborn or narrow-minded, trying to fish in the same spot all day, well, the result would probably have been much less fish. The same holds true for investing. Opportunities do not stay in the same place for long, and no one knows where they will show up next. Therefore, it pays to have an open mind and not shrink your universe of possibilities to, say, a single industry or sector. Many funds do this by, for example, only focusing on ESG types of companies, only focusing on high dividend paying companies, only focusing on Swedish companies, only focusing on crypto or what have you. Opportunities don't work like that. And frankly, I think that the fund managers know this too. It's just that it's easier to market and sell their products when they are niched. Something I've never told before is that I almost made this mistake when creating this channel. I considered naming it the gaming investor instead of the Swedish investor, because for a moment I was thinking about only focusing on companies in the gaming industry. My reasoning was that I would create a really solid circle of competence within that field, but it would have been too narrow of a field. There's a difference between staying within your circle of competence and being small-minded. Opportunities can pop up anywhere, and ironically, they tend to move away from where people think they are to where people think they can't possibly be, because it is people who decide the prices of stocks. This we shall get back to really soon. Number eight, staying active all the time. If you feel you have to invest every day, um, you're gonna make a lot of mistakes. It just it isn't that kind of a business. You have to wait till you get the fat pitch. Who do you think is most likely to succeed? The tennis player who plays five games a day or the one that plays five games per year? The author who writes five times per week or the one that writes five times per year? The investor who buys five stocks per week or the one that buys five per year. Investing is one of those rare exceptions where inaction is rewarded. You can't buy the equivalent of a Coca-Cola at a fair price every day. It just doesn't work like that. There are extensive bear markets where opportunities are plentiful, and there are bull markets where opportunities cannot be found, no matter how many rocks you turn. And sometimes there are opportunities but they're just not within your circle of competence. Buffett says that an investor must behave like a baseball player who cannot possibly strike out. You don't swing at every ball that is thrown at you. That's just a recipe for some really awful misses. No, you must wait for the fat pitch. Number nine, diversifying too much. If you really know businesses, you probably shouldn't know more than six of them. I mean, if you can identify six wonderful businesses, that is all the diversification you need, and you're going to make a lot of money, and I will guarantee you that going into a seventh one is going to, rather than putting more money into your first one, it's got to be a terrible mistake. Very few people have gotten rich on their seventh best idea, but a lot of people have gotten rich on their best idea. Diversification is a hot potato among investors. I've discussed this on multiple occasions already, so I'll be quite short here and point you to this other video if you want to go more in depth on the topic. It basically boils down to this. If you are not willing to read up on individual companies on a regular basis, you should diversify. Probably buying something like an index fund, 
to protect yourself against the lack of knowledge. But if you are what Buffett calls a know-something investor, someone who enjoys staying up to date with specific businesses and industries, you should leverage this knowledge to achieve above market returns. If you buy the 30 largest companies of the S&P 500, you shouldn't expect to perform much differently from the index people. An analogy comes to mind. When I was younger, there was some who thought that mixing 40% liquor with 30% liquor must make the resulting cocktail even stronger. Maybe even 70%? This is of course silly. Adding anything weaker than 40% to the 40% one will only dilute the result. Just like adding your 7th best stock pick will dilute the performance of your top 6 portfolio. For the sake of transparency, I currently own 10 stocks myself, and I think that investors will forever debate what the perfect number is. Number 10. Confirmation bias. There's no question the human mind that what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact. That is a talent everyone seems to have mastered, and Charlie and I have made big mistakes because, in effect, we have been unwilling to, uh, to look afresh at something. Uh, you know, that happens. Charlie Munger has an analogy about this that I think is quite funny. What I'm saying here is that the human mind is a lot like the human egg, and the human egg has a shut-up device. When one sperm gets in, it shuts down so the next one can't get in. As an investor, this is a very costly mistake to make. We love to interpret and seek out new information so that our prior conclusions remain intact, when what we should be doing is the exact opposite. We must try to stay rational and weigh the pros and cons for all of the companies that we keep in our portfolio. I've had a very hard time with this historically, but I think that I've found two antidotes, the darling killing funnel and the bear pill. Say that you have decided to keep 10 companies in your portfolio. Then you should have at least 20 candidates before you decide on which 10 to keep. These 20 aren't companies that you just sweep by. No, these are companies like Minovia that you spend perhaps a day or so researching. If you follow this advice, you'll be forced to kill some of your darlings, and you'll be much more rational as a result. If you are taking the bear pill, you are committed to, before adding any company to your portfolio, making a very intentional choice to seek out the potential pitfalls of that investment, or maybe hire a friend who is willing to play devil's advocate. Number 11. Following the herd. Humans will continue to make the same mistakes that they have made in the past. I mean, they get, they get fearful when other people are fearful. I mean, that's... But when, when they get greedy, they get greedy in mass, too. I mean, it just that's where Charlie and I have an edge. We, didn't, we don't have an edge particularly in many other ways. But we are able, perhaps better than most, to not really get caught up with what other people are doing. And As you've probably observed by now, investing is full of things that are counterintuitive, just like the mistake of jumping over seven-foot bars and staying active all the time. In many, many things in life, it pays to listen to the crowd. If your parents or friends like your girlfriend, she's probably a pretty good partner. If a lot of people like a particular movie, chances are higher that you'll enjoy it too. If people are really jealous about your career, it means you are probably doing pretty good for yourself, unless there's something you're not telling them, of course. Well, not so with investing. In fact, if your parents and all your friends agree with the most recent stock that you recommended, it probably means that you should not buy it. As another excellent investor, Howard Marks, puts it, what is clear to the broad consensus of investors is almost always wrong. How can this be? It's because there's no such thing as a good idea regardless of price. Sure, Tesla may take over the automotive industry, but it is not going to be a good investment if it is already priced as high as the whole automotive industry. If there's one situation where I think that people are extra vulnerable to following the herd right off a cliff, it's when others, worst case their friends, are getting rich doing something that looks easy. This is my biggest investing mistake so far. I put quite a bit of money in a small startup that a friend I've gotten rich investing in. The company wasn't in my circle of competence, but I threw my hard-earned money after it nonetheless, because his returns were so alluring, and I also knew he was involved in the company. The jury is not out yet, but if this doesn't turn out to be my costliest mistake so far, 
I'm just dumb lucky. Number 12, omissions. The biggest mistakes we made by far are mistakes of omission and not commission. I mean, it's the things I knew enough to do, they were within my circle of competence, and I was sucking my thumb. I probably cost Berkshire at least $5 billion, for example, by sucking my thumb 20 years ago or close to it when Fannie Mae was, was having some troubles and we could have bought the whole company for practically nothing yet. Pretty much every mistake on this list so far has been mistakes of commission. You take some sort of action to create them. However, as Buffett points out, sometimes the biggest mistake of all is not to do something. You know, not asking that girl that you are interested in if she wants to go on a date with you. Never taking a risk in your career. Or, as in Buffett's case, not investing in something that was a given. This mistake is extra annoying if it is combined with one that we've talked about before, getting attached to your purchasing price. Buffett has often mentioned that this happened to him with Walmart. He was acquiring a stake in the company, I think it was in the early 90s, but the price of the share ran away a little. Of course, if you think that a company is a great opportunity at X dollars, it is probably still a good opportunity at 1.1x, but Buffett's mind was attached to the first price he got and he hoped that the stock would come down again. It never did. Buffett has said that this mistake cost Berkshire Hathaway about $8 billion in would-be profits. He nearly did the same mistake with one of his greatest investments of all time, C's Candy, but on this occasion, Charlie Munger managed to convince him otherwise. Of course, hindsight is always 20-20, but when something is within your circle of competence and you've identified it as an opportunity, you don't just stand there and nibble at it. You take a full bite. <laughs> These are the 12 deadly sins of investing. But perhaps you have another one up. So the purpose of showing that was while well, we're thinking about some stocks in our own game we're playing. But what I'm listening to when I'm watching that and I'm thinking about, I'm not thinking about buying, I'm thinking about structuring my company. I'm thinking about what does my business have to do to meet those criteria. Because whether I'm on the public market or not, the rules really are the same as far as success of a business. And if it's overcomplicated, then you've got a higher probability of making a mistake uh, with your business, not investing in it. You're, you're investing your life in your business. You know? And so when we're, when we're involved in a management team, uh, these are at least some of the factors we should be considering as we build our company uh, at some point, we may be public as well. Uh, I've been CEO of a company, and we looked at our stock price 20 times a day. And, and I watched our stock price at one period uh, move from $17.50 a share to $2 a share. And that's a ride you don't want to have. And how do you turn that back around? So, so thinking about what the public markets are doing, at some point in time, you might be in a job where you have to do that. I was. I didn't own the company. I was just helping drive. And and we were driving in the wrong direction, right? And so uh, being aware of what are the kinds of things that you have to do to pump that back up and turn that <coughs> around and build a pub public appetite for uh, the investment potential and get the analysts to start to write the right things about your company, that's not what this class is about for the public market, but it is for your personal business or your business that you're working in, helping them uh, make the numbers so that the, the, the business performs those kinds of things. Uh, GameStop, by the way, that he talked about there, uh, you probably read some of the things about a little hiccup that happened with GameStop once on the public market when all the computers were set to watch for a little 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 wobble in the, in the, in the spinning top and Wall Street stopped sales of, of their stock completely uh, for a few days for the market to restabilize. Uh, you, you probably read about that. It, it hit our news here locally. But their, their stock's at 20 bucks. So he was wrong about what he said. It's not performed well uh, over, the stock, over time. If you bought it on day one, you're fine. Uh, but when he was talking about there, it was up at $85. And, and so, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a fool's task to try to guess what the market's going to do. It's not a fool's task to try to build our business to be sound no matter what the market does and be able to weather the storms as the uh, market does undulate. 
And every kind of business has its ups and downs. Every, every market has its uh, tough times. But if there's one takeaway from that video, it's that the ship that's the biggest and best is most able to withstand the storm, right? And so the, the stronger we can build our ship, the better our chances are uh, of weathering, you know, a, a housing crash in St. George. Who would have thought it could happen? Uh, some of you lived through it. I lived through it. I remember a year when Washington County, uh, I'm sorry, when St. George pulled uh, eight building permits for the year. For the year. Some of you got nodded your head. You remember when that happened? And now we're pulling, what, 400 building eight permits minutes. a month? Uh, you know, I hope that it doesn't drop to that. We doubled it for eight a year. Uh, no, we've seen, we've seen every market. The airlines business has crashed and burned. You know, uh, of, over time, we see different market segments going through difficulties, and our businesses may be one of those at various times. So, how do we build it so that we can sustain that? Uh, we may talk a little bit about uh, one example uh, right here in St. George. You you know the company, um, and I won't disclose any confidential information. But when the the real estate market crashed. Uh, there was a company that was near the top of it uh, that uh, went through what everybody else did, but they went through it differently, and I'll talk about it in the class, and that's S&S Homes. Uh, S&S, we all know them as a builder. If you go to the Prada Homes this, uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, you'll see a house or two that they build, and uh, they survived uh, the, the complete crash of the real estate market uh, when a bunch of their competitors did not survive that and had to go bankrupt and then re, uh, reestablish themselves later. Uh, SNS did not have to go through that. It was tough for everybody, but they managed it the way I want us to learn to manage uh, the ups and downs of our industry. Whatever industry it is, uh, we will have those. And if we know how to drive our financials, then we can survive it when things get tough because uh, we will have predicted some of it and we will be able to manage our way through it. So with that we've burned most of the time for today and we've looked at balance sheets. Uh, we've looked at a couple of things on on how to read some balance sheets. Uh, we are going to look at income statements and statements of cash flow and then we are going to actually use some data like you're talking about how we can then look at our company's financials. And I think once you you see us doing that I think you'll get excited about uh, your own financial statements if you have access to it. I know everybody in the room does not, uh, but at some point in time, you will have access to financial statements in a, another business or a business that you're actively involved in, and this will be meaningful to you. So have a good weekend, everybody, and I will see you at uh, 5.30 on Tuesday. Do start making investment on your game, your investment game. I will be tracking and watching uh, where we're at on that game. And just so you all know, I did make a trade uh, late this afternoon before the markets closed, and I've already lost $325. Just so you know, you, you all have an edge on me. <laughs>